Earlier this year, uh, we announced something called the machine. And what I'm going to go through today is essentially the technical details of the machine. And uh, in order to set the frame properly, you need to understand that uh, the machine is a research activity. It is not a product. It's not ready to ship. It is not part of a current product roadmap. Um, it is very much a research activity with all of the risks, trials, and tribulations that that entails. Um, because somebody, there is a natural tendency to start asking the questions like, when are you going to ship it? Um, and so I'll give you some dates and timelines of how we're at least thinking about this, but it's important to set the frame of reference uh, correctly. Um, if you are a physicist, a chemist, or a deep technologist, you will be absolutely horrified at the technical simplifications that I'm about to go through. If you are a non-technologist, you will be so appreciative of the <laughs> technical simplifications that I'm about to go through. So uh, please enjoy. All right, so the other thing, uh, just logistically, is I had a tablet failure um, yesterday before I uh, left to come here. And uh, so normally I draw this, and uh, so my, I have a backup plan, which we're going to try. And the backup to my backup was to use the chalkboard, but then they decided to do this. So, uh, so we might be in trouble. So my, my backup plan right now is I have a live scribe pen and a paper tied to my iPhone, and hopefully what I draw on that piece of paper will show up on that screen over there. And um, we're going to cross our fingers that the, uh, the tech works. Um, if you're wondering, yes, I am using an iPhone, and just remember that your wife and FaceTime trumps free software. <laughs> so, um, all right, so let's uh, give this a shot here. So let's start with um, sort of what was the, um, the impetus for the machine. And there's essentially two general uh, views of this. One is that um, our industry, the IT industry, has an insatiable capacity to create new data. And we've all seen the terms big data, et cetera, but essentially we are creating data, new data all the time and we don't see an end to the new data creation. The problem, however, is, and I'll go through this, that the technologies that we use to store and process data are hitting a wall. They're reaching an end of their ability to scale. And if you live in the IT industry, one of the things you've gotten used to over the past couple of decades is you buy, let's say, a server, um, and it has X amount of memory, X amount of storage, and so on and so forth, and you expect that in 18 months to two years, the new one you buy is double what you bought two years before, right? So when I talk about we're reaching an end of scale, it, that's what I'm referring to, to this thing we take for granted that all hardware has commoditized and will simply double every couple of years until the end of time is reaching an end. The laws of physics are actually catching up to us. The second thing that kind of drove us here was um, energy and uh, our ability to continue to generate uh, energy in order to power um, these data centers that we continue to create under this notion of double and double and double, um, we essentially run out of a capacity to be able to generate the energy required in order to power these things. And so that combination is what got us to um, actually figuring out how do we get around that. And part of my job as CTO in running labs is we need to think beyond that two, three year product roadmap life cycle and say, what happens in 5, 10, or 15 years. And so that's where we started to work. Now, the thing that is unusual about this particular activity is we are talking about a research project, and we normally don't go out and talk publicly, like I'm doing today, about a research project. And um, I'll give you more details later, but the reason that we have actually gone public is actually because of open source. So I'll talk a little bit later about our intent to create a new operating system from the ground up and that operating system will be open source. And in order for us to engage with the community and with universities, et cetera, in that activity, it was not possible for us to keep our research project secret, right? To go to a community, universities, et cetera, and say, hey, would you work on my thing, but I can't tell you what my thing is, um, was actually not very viable. 
And so, um, so as Evan was saying, there was a very much a foundational element of free software and open source that drove us actually speaking publicly this early in the time frame. Okay, so with that as a bit of an intro, um, let's start with um, main memory. And so if you think about any of your computer, whether it's a laptop, a phone, a server, or whatever, it has main memory or DRAM. You ready? Um, and the easy way to think about DRAM is as a bucket that holds electrons. Wow, it's working. That bucket is Okay. All right, I'm impressed with this. <laughs> For a backup plan, it's kind of like, whoa. Um, so, uh, now, again, this is where the deep technologists are like aghast, you know, how do we call DRAM a bucket? Um, yes, I know it's a chance to pass it around and all that kind of stuff. So we're, um, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's a bucket that holds electrons. The thing that's happening is we're now at a point where this bucket is about 20 nanometers in size. And our, we continue and we have been continuing to shrink that bucket. And so what happened actually was at 28 nanometers, I was in a previous job. I ran HP's high-end server business. And uh, for those of you who might be familiar with things like Superdomes, um, if you're more familiar with the Sun World, what Sun would have called it a UV 10K or 25K or something like that. But the very large system. And in that job, one of the things that we had to do was that we had to essentially do stress testing that went far beyond um, industry standard servers and equipment. And that stress testing involved memory stress testing, and we had a special memory stress test called Hammer. That's just its name, and it's an internal test. And all memory from all vendors at 28 nanometers failed Hammer. All memory, all vendors failed hammer. And that was our first evidence that not, not, not everything was well in our industry, that we were starting to hit a real problem. And, um, and so this was a, a, a pretty significant escalation inside of HP. Um, <coughs> executives at the time, like Ann Livermore, were actively engaged. Um, it was actually called the word line hammer issue. Uh, we had a group in Fort Collins, Colorado that was actually able to write code to force the issue to occur. I mean, this was major stuff. And so at the end of the day, the way the industry ended up dealing with this issue right now is doing things like doubling or tripling refresh rates. And the other thing was enhancing error correction so that we could detect the difference between um, a hammer failure, if you want to call it that, and a real bit failure in DRAM. So our expectation is that we hit a scale wall on DRAM at about the 2017 time frame. Okay? So um, notice I call it a scale wall and I don't call it end of life. Right? So it's not like we're all going to wake up one day and the memory in our computer stops. Right? So that, that's not going to happen. Um, but the, again, this notion that you know you bought your laptop and it had eight gigs of memory, and next year it's 16, and the year after that's 32, that is going to come to an end. And so, what do we do? <coughs> All right. Before we get to that, the next piece of companion technology that we're mostly accustomed to, um, this was DRAM, is actually flat. Flash is a little bit different than a bucket. The way I kind of draw this one is um, three layers, and there's a thing in the middle called a floating gate. This floating gate is what holds the electron. So when you apply a power through this current, you essentially force electrons onto the floating gate. When you remove the power, the electrons are essentially stuck there, and that's why with flash, when you pull the power, your state is maintained. But the same problem kind of occurs in that this floating gate is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we're going to run into a similar issue with flash. Now, for those of you involved in the technology, you might have heard of things like 3D man flash and those kinds of technologies. So there have been 
ongoing enhancements to deal with uh, the end of scale wall on flash. And that's why our prediction on that end of scale on flash is closer to about um, the 2020 time frame. So we think VRAM hits a wall before uh, uh, flash does. And so we're in a point here where if we want to achieve um, persistence and performance, uh, we're in trouble because the foundational technologies that we count on uh, to do that are essentially reaching a limit in their ability to scale, and we're creating vast amounts of new data. So what do we do? So as I said, um, the industry, oh, did I? Uh, there you go. So the uh, issue we're going to have to deal with is that my phone is timing out. All right. Yes? When IT has control of your phone, they tell you how often it times out. All right? So I'll have to remember to go touch the phone. It's a backup plan, folks. <laughs> All right. So the industry is, um, it, it is very well aware of this issue, right? So this is not something that we at HP, we have some magic crystal ball and we figured this out and we're like smarter than everybody else. Absolutely not the case. The industry is, um, is very much aware of this. And there are about three different technologies under development in order to deal with this issue. Um, and the three technologies uh, are FTP, Okay, there's no clip on this. I don't know how to. Did the clip fall down or something? Okay. Okay, I don't know how to do the pen and the mic and all at the same time. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are three different technologies. Now, again, if you're deep into the technology, you might want to argue with me a little bit. Um, but it's essentially uh, STT RAM, PC RAM, and RERAM are the three main technologies. And once I get my clip, I'll write that down. Um, and so the first one, uh, which is STT RAM, stands for Spin Transfer Torque. Um, and it's essentially a magnetoresistive RAM. And so, let me see if I can multitask the mic. Okay. And the third one is... Um, Resistive RAM. So the way spin transfer torque works um, is, as I said, it's a magnetoresistive RAM. So if you're not a technologist, think back to your high school days and you worked with uh, magnets. Essentially, think about it as a permanent magnet on one layer and then a rotating magnet that spins, hence the name spin transfer torque. Uh, in one direction or the other as you apply a current through um, the line. So, simple way to think about STT is a spinning magnet, and it's actually very, very hard to do because you've got to apply a pulse of current which will cause um, the magnet to spin in the direction and exactly um, how you need to. All right, so, um, so that is a, a simple version of spin transfer torque. Now, the advantage of spin transfer torque is that it's actually quite fast, right? So this, the, the spinning magnet is actually a very fast technology. Um, but the downside is that, um, so this is a good thing, on the downside, it doesn't scale very well. It actually scales worse than DRAM. Um, but in the immediate term, those who are proponents of, of uh, STT uh, are very much looking at it as maybe one or two generations of a DRAM replacement. Okay. Phase change is probably the most mature and the most research um, of the technologies. And in fact, when I launched the machine and I talked about Memristor, which I'll talk about next, uh, we had the very, very innovative people at Dell 
um, criticize. Um, that was a joke. Don't <laughs> I mean, innovation. Don't, okay, anyways. Um, <laughs> who basically said, hey, HP is clueless, you know, uh, PC RAM will come first. So I'll get to it in a little while, but it actually, it was, it was actually unfortunate because um, the, the guy who was quoted, and I know he, because uh, it actually came from IBM, and I have a healthy degree of respect for um, the research team and the scientists at IBM, and so I'm pretty sure that somebody in their communications team got control of something and attached his name to it um, because I'm pretty sure this guy wouldn't have said those things. Um, but I don't know anyway. So the, uh, the interesting thing is that PC RAM will likely come first. So how does PC RAM work? Um, essentially, as the name implies, it, it's a material that changes phase and it changes between being a glass and a crystal. So rather than write down chemical formulas, so non-technologists say thank you, um, what the what, simple way to think about it is if, if you ever burnt music onto a CD-ROM, the material that's on that CD-ROM, that's kind of the same material that's used for phase change. And the idea is you heat up the material, and if it cools really fast and turns into a glass, it's a zero. And if it cools slowly, it turns into a crystal, and and that represents a one. And um, the most likely use for phase change, at least in the early days, is flash. And so um, actually some Samsung phones already have some phase change memory. And so oftentimes as you, you know, if you have conversations about non-volatile memory and next generation technologies and people have this competitive discussion about what's going to win, phase change generally comes out on top as one that people view as the most viable or the most likely. Um, and um, the real challenge that we see in phase change um, is uh, performance. So um, now um, the proponents of phase change um, think that they've solved those issues, but at least right now from what we know, phase change, its biggest challenge is heating and cooling material is a time-consuming task, even if you're dealing at the millisecond level. And uh, we see some real challenges in this becoming um, a DRAM type of replacement over the long term. All right, so the third one, uh, generically called reram or resistive RAM, is something that HP calls memristor. And uh, there are variants of this that, I, so you might hear about th something called CB RAM or conductive bridge RAM. And so those are all variants of kind of the same thing. Um, in the case of, of uh, Memristor or reram, it works on a, pre on a premise of what's called ion mobility. So if you're not a chemist, um, you know that um, atoms have electrons that spin around them. And the idea of creating an ion is to either extract or remove um, electrons from the outer layer of an atom. And then you basically have an ionified atom. So the way this works is we create, uh, we have two layers of tantalum dioxide. And we create what's in one layer what's called oxygen vacancies through there. And this entire structure is about five nanometer in size, okay? And by growing and shrinking this thing um, using a little bit of energy, we essentially cause it to move between a zero and a one. So that's essentially how it works. Ion mobility is oxygen vacancies. We apply a current, and we can modify a zero or a one. Now, notice that I said this is a five nanometer structure, and DRAM is currently at about a 20 nanometer structure. Right. So you can already see that we get some scale benefits uh, from that technology. But the real reason that we like Memristor is not just scale, it's also performance. And so the idea with Memristor is that we can today in the lab, we can switch at picosecond speeds, uh, which is much faster than DRAM. Now the surrounding circuitry, everything else, means that on day one we'll probably still be slower than DRAM, we'll be flat faster than flash, um, and over time will improve performance and try to get us to a DRAM style of, of performance. So the big point um, in all of this is 
All of these technologies are persistent memory. So that's a key point, right? So flash is persistent, right? You remove the power, it maintains state. DRAM is non-persistent. You pull the power, you lose state, okay? All of the replacement technologies, so for, let's say you're not a fan of Memristor, you think we're all full of it and it's not going to work and all this kind of stuff. The thing to keep in mind is, regardless of which technology you or your company happens to be a fan of, they are all non-volatile or persistent technologies. The reason why we are putting all of our bets on Memristor and um, RERAM is because we think it's the only viable candidate for something called universal memory. So what does universal memory mean? Essentially, it's the merging of memory and flash into a single entity. And now you get to the most fundamental concept of the machine. So let me, um, let me kind of explain that a little bit. We'll flip the page here. It's kind of working OK. <laughs> Um, all right, so think about computing, and it doesn't matter if you think about a phone, a tablet, a supercomputer, a server, whatever. Computing for the past 60 years has been architected the exact same way. Right? CPU, memory, I.O., the first version of I.O. was storage, and the second version of I.O. was networking. And these were connected up through a copper pipe. So for the past 60 years, that's a computer. Hasn't changed. So for what is supposed to be one of the most innovative industries on planet Earth, we actually have not changed this in 60 years. And in fact, it gets worse because when we created virtualization, VMware being the first, we actually created a software version of this. Wow. Pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> you can imagine what it's like working for me, right? Um, no, they can't. <laughs> Bdale still goes through counseling sessions. Um, so the, the, the core of the machine is for the very first time in the computing industry, we are collapsing the storage memory hierarchy using universal memory. So we're now combining memory and storage and we are flattening. And so the architectural the basic architecture of the machine is very simple. Imagine, if you will, a pool of what I'll put in quotation marks, unlimited, because there's always a limit, cores. So you have unlimited CPU cores all bound together. And you have a pool of, again, I'll use quotation marks for unlimited. And I'll talk about the limits here universal memory. And all of this interconnected with a photonics pipe. And I'll get back to the photonics pipe in a minute. But that picture right there, let me bring it up here a little bit, that is the machine. Simple version, that's it, it's the machine. And it will probably require you to think about this for days and weeks. Um, and, I, and I tell you that because we went through this process, right? Not because I somehow think we're smarter than anybody else. It's because we went through and we've had the opportunity to go through long times of thinking about the implications of this. But now think for a moment about what this means. If you think about an operating system, if you're a fan of Linux, 
I think there's no fans of Windows here, but what the heck. Um, so whether it's Linux or Windows or any other operating system, Unix, VMS, pick your whatever. Um, the vast majority of what an operating system does today is shuffle data back and forth between storage and memory. It's kind of what it does. Yeah, it schedules CPUs and stuff like that and it allocates memory. But at the end of the day, it pages stuff in and out of memory as you need it. And so um, in the early days of the machine, we had a few people where I would do this presentation and um, they would, and actually one of them was a, a board member at HP, um, that kind of said, well, so if you do this, kind of what happens to the operating system? I said, wow, that's pretty insightful. And the reality is we came to the conclusion maybe it's time to start over and create a new operating system from the ground up. So um, I'll start at the bottom here. So we are, in fact, doing that. We, are, we have started a research effort for a brand new operating system. And the idea behind the brand new operating system is that it considers the notion that the storage memory hierarchy has been flattened and that we now have direct accessibility to all of our data. Our first version of the machine, the prototype we are working on, is 150 nodes, 157 bytes, uh, petabytes, excuse me, 157 petabytes of byte addressable main memory. Okay, so think about that for a second. You have byte addressable 150 petabytes of memory. What could you do with that? Okay. Now, for the technologists in the room, this will mean more than those who aren't deep technologists. The machine eliminates the notion of read writes. So, if you've grown up in the world of storage and disk storage, you're familiar with three instructions, right? Seek, read, and write. And you read and write blocks of data. In essence, you do block I.O. The machine only comprehends load store. So essentially, you load a byte and you store a byte. And there is no seek, there is no read, there is no write, there is no block I.O. Right. So again, you'll probably sleep a few nights thinking through the cascading implications of what that really means. And so the code name for the operating system right now, by the way, is Carbon. Um, and it is a clean sheet operating system to essentially comprehend this notion of a vast pool of non-volatile memory that is all byte addressable. Um, we have a parallel effort that is amusingly enough called Linux++. I keep telling the team it needs to be called Linux minus uh, minus, but I've not made any progress because what we are doing is essentially stripping out all of the bits of Linux that do read write and um, trying to um, maintain the POSIX interface layer so that we maintain some degree of application compatibility. And the odds are that the first version and prototypes of the machine will have Linux++ available before Carbon. Right? But in order to fully leverage the capability of the machine, we do believe we will need a new operating system and we will transition over time and we know that time will likely take years if not decades of time. So we're, I think we're reasonably pragmatic about what it's going to take um, to kind of go through the transition. So as I said, the intent is for Carbon to be um, open source. Um, we have a team that is working on both the technology side of this as well as the licensing side of this. And in fact, Evan will likely help us with that um, so that we build a strong foundation for what that will look like and our intent, of course, is to have as many university partners and any other community members um, who have the opportunity to or want to uh, be part of an effort to create the first new architecture for an operating system in about 40 years. Um, I don't know, that feels like a pretty cool project to me, but you know, call me weird. Um, and so, uh, so we're hoping that in early 2015 we'll have the first drops of code and we'll have kind of figured out um, 
uh, the strategy around how, what we're doing from an operating system perspective to sort of go do this. All right, so, um, and as I said, the reason why the machine went public at this stage was because of our need to um, disclose to universities and others that we were working on the machine so that they could work on the operating system, and that's why we had to go public. All right, so now let's talk about the next layer. Do we have anybody here from a database company? Doesn't matter which one. No? Yes? Maybe? Sort of? Okay. If you work in a database company, um, I'm going to crush your world. <laughs> All right. So um, the other thought process that we had to go through is, you know, above the operating system, you're going to have apps and things like that. And especially in the enterprise, you're processing data is the net of what you're doing, right? It's a dramatic oversimplification, but it's kind of what we do, is we process data. And now you can process lots and lots of data because you got, you know, 150 petabytes at your disposal if you choose to have that big of a machine. Now, um, the interesting thing is then we started to think about, well, okay, what do we do from a data management perspective? And as you would expect, when we started this, we started to think about, well, so how do we go build a relational database inside of our unlimited pool of main memory? And as we were working through that, we said, okay, so why are we doing that? Because now if you start to think about it, all of the databases that we deal today, whether they're relational databases, columnar style databases, network databases, document databases, object stores, et cetera, they are all built because you have to flush to disk, right? They're all built with this notion that you need to have persistence for your objects, whatever form those objects take. But when you're dealing with an unlimited pool of non-volatile memory, this notion of secondary persistence goes away because everything is by default persistent. And so you go through the thought process of, who, what does that mean? Now, in parallel, what we were thinking about was um, what are the workloads that we want to optimize the machine to run, right? Because if you can figure out what are your top few workloads, then it helps you with the design effort and making design trade-offs or the thing. And so this combination of how do we manage data and which, which workloads should we optimize for got us to the conclusion that, again, a bit of an oversimplification, that when you have that much and that large of a pool of non-volatile memory, everything turns into a graph problem. And so essentially, you don't need to go through a, a relational data store and doing you know, table joins and all of those things become almost nonsensical in a world where everything is right there. And what happens now is you want to optimize for a graph style environment. So the way I usually describe this is with an example um, that uh, is, will feel a little bit like a real world example and I call it the airline example. Um, if you fly, for example, on United Airlines and sometimes I've been in a situation where I land at Denver International Airport and the pilot comes on and says, good news, we're here a half hour early. Bad news, got no gate. And especially if you're a geek, you go, okay, like how does that happen, right? Like really? You know? And you look out the window to make it worse and you see like a bunch of open gates. And you're like, are these people stupid? Just turn the plane over and park it in. Like, I mean, how hard could it be? Well, the reality is it's actually one of the hardest technology problems there is because you don't know where the ground crew is and if the ground crew is busy. You don't know if there is a, um, uh, uh, a gate crew uh, available. All of the passengers that are currently scheduled to get on the plane you're getting off are somewhere else at the airport and now you have to issue a gate change announcement. Right? And the cascading list of what happens um, and all of the systems that manage baggage for connection baggage and so on and so forth, it kind of just gets, and so this notion of landing and not having a gate when you see gates available is actually a really hard problem. So the way graph analytics solves that kind of problem is now imagine every aircraft, every gate of every airport in the world, every baggage handler, every pilot, every flight attendant, 
all in memory, all at the same time. And now, you can choose to optimize the graph in whatever way you want, depending on which events occur. And so if you have a weather event and you're an Asian airline, you optimize for customer service. And if you're a US airline, you optimize for cost. Okay, okay you got that one. All right, I'm doing better. All right, so, um, but uh, that's the kind of thing you can do, right? So you have everything in main memory and you can optimize the graph in whatever way you want to and you can do it in real time. And so that is the power of graph analytics. Um, and probably, you know, I, I'm only guessing now, I don't know this, but probably one of the state of the arts in terms of graph analytics today is very likely Facebook because, um, you know, the human connections of billion, a billion people on Facebook is a graph problem of sorts. Um, but at the, while it's a large problem from a scale perspective, it's a relatively simple problem when compared to the airline example where you have multiple node, nodes and multiple vectors going to every point in the graph. And so again, I'll encourage you to think about that um, as you um, have difficulty falling asleep over the next few days, um, is what are the consequences of that and what happens to my applications? And so part of the challenge that we have going through the machine is at some level, there's a part of me that is highly motivated to do what we call a flash cut. So in other words, we have a legacy computing world, and that legacy computing world can go do whatever it's going to do, and I'm going to flash cut to a whole new world, and those who want to come along, um, please come along for the ride. Most people, though, are very uncomfortable with that approach, and most people want this transition approach, right? So how do I take my current world and make it work on the new world, even though it's not optimal for the new world. So this is the reason why we're doing things like Linux++, um, and very likely the first data engine that we'll have available will be Hadoop. Um, it actually does lend itself pretty well to um, the architecture of the machine. And then with that combination, we can actually attack a fair, um, a fairly good number of things going through that. All right, so um, let me boot back up here. And we'll go back into hardware geek land. All right, so I mentioned a little bit earlier. Yes? So this memory, although it will be easily accessed, it still won't be free, right? It won't be free in terms of either the cost or the energy. So you still have to have operating systems. You still have to have the computer power that swap out the tasks that are you know, being worked on now versus not worked on, et cetera, et cetera. Why? If the memory is the same price as your storage, why would you do any swapping? So yes, so the core reason for Memristor, it uses no power at all, so zero power to maintain state. And because we can switch at picosecond speeds, uses very, very little energy in order to switch. Um, the numbers that we quoted at Discover was six times the performance at ADX less power. Okay? So we intend to deliver significantly more scale, more density, um, at a massive amount of less energy consumption. So the reasons that the cost profile energy reasons that you would have normally done that, we hope to take away. And in fact, you bring up an interesting point. Um, and it, let's go back to my friends at Dell. Most people who are looking at um, memory and persistent memory and whether it's phase change or something else, you typically have this triangle where at the tip of the triangle, you have um, your L1 caches or SRAM that live inside the processor, right? And then at the bottom of the triangle, you essentially have your hard disk drive or your rotating media. And then in between, you have things like um, flash and uh, DRAM and other layers in the, in the hierarchy. Now, it turns out, if I were to draw this out fully, there is somewhere between 9 and 11 layers 
to the storage memory hierarchy. If you consider things like read and write caches on your disk drives um, and things like that, you actually get to about 9 to 11 layers. And we call this the volatility chain. Because essentially what you're doing um, in a computer today is you are managing the volatility of data until you reach persistence. Because the point at which is in the cache, and from there going through the hierarchy to make it to a persistent data store like a hard disk or a flash disk um, is, uh, is essentially managing a volatility chain. And so most people, and this is a core difference between the machine and at least everything else that we have seen people working on, is their intent is to, in effect, add another layer in the hierarchy. And you know we could have philosophical agreements all day, disagreements all day long. I'm just articulating for you the difference between the machine and where other people are thinking about what do we do with these new next generation memories. And for most people, because they think about substitution and they think about evolution in a graceful way, they tend to think about adding a new layer to the hierarchy. And our goal with the machine is to actually eliminate the hierarchy. When people ask me, you know, describe nirvana, what's the final end state, right? And this will take a long time. My end state is the day I can get an SOC or a system on a chip that has a core, a pool of memristor, and a silicon photonics connector coming off of it, I will have, like, I can retire, okay? <laughs> like, my work here is done. Yes. One of the things in that hierarchy is the local cache. Yes. So not initially. So that's a little bit of what I was just talking about. Um, so all CPU cores today um, have L1, L2 caches. If you get into large Superdome class systems where you now deal with NUMA and cache coherency and those kinds of things, you'll have L3 caches and that sort of thing. Um, the machine is not a NUMA or not a cache. It is a non-uniform memory act. So it is a NUMA machine, but it is not a cache coherent NUMA machine. Okay. Um, so as I said, there's 157 nodes. Each node is 5U. So there, there is, it is non-uniform um, memory access in that each node understands the concept of local versus remote memory. But they're not cache coherent. But to your question, um, the all CPU vendors today, whether ARM, x86, or other, all have essentially L1 caches at a minimum, and if they're multi-core, L2 caches. Um, and um, the reality is that's not going to change in the immediate term, right? So let's, and when I say immediate term, probably 10 years, because from the point at which you des decide to develop an SOC, it's usually three to four years before you have the SOC. So it's probably going to take me, you know, I've got a few years before I get to the machine. Then I can demonstrate to the SOC vendors, here's what we could do. Then, you know, light bulb goes off. Then we can start approaching redesigns and re-architecture of SOCs. So we're probably looking at 10 years. Um, in an ideal world, I would love to have, in fact, I'll tell you a story. Um, Bidel can tell you how I have a habit of trying to defy the laws of physics. Yes, Bidel is accustomed to this. So I ask the teams to go off and do things that are physically impossible. Um, but it's kind of fun to see how far they go before they give up. But anyways, um, I wrote a paper in 2010 um, about, it wasn't called the machine then, but essentially the machine in 2010. Um, and I was doing it with a guy by the name of Kirk Bresnicker. And uh, my first version through that was that all caches were eliminated, right? There were no caches in my version of the machine because I think there are hundreds of millions of lines of cache management code that I would love to just get rid of and simplify the machine. But it was one of those examples where, you know, and, it's kind of, and actually it's kind of amusing when you have like a fancy title and a big job that the people under you, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we go to the boss and tell them he's like, like lunatic, like how do we go do that, right? And so they have meetings on how to figure out how to tell me um, that I'm crazy. And so, um, B. Dale's nodding. Um, I assume that, I didn't know it was true. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and so eventually they do find a way to come to me and they say, okay, dude, you're going to need some caches somewhere in this architecture and you're not going to get rid of them all. Um, and the reality is while I would love nothing more than to essentially have a compute engine and a pool of memory and nothing in between, um, you know, SRAM operates at like a thousand times faster. The odds that I'm, that I'm going to get there are probably slim, at least in my lifetime. But, you know, I have a dream. And uh, my dream is a no-cash machine that is highly efficient. Because um, sometimes the other thing is, my view is, we get all enamored with things like cache layers. And we don't consider the cost of complexity um, and the cost of the code that we write to manage all of these things. And sometimes I wonder if we actually removed all of these layers and removed all of that code and dramatically simplified the environment that we work in, um, would we actually be better off even if there is a slight performance penalty in doing that? Yeah. So, so we'll see. We'll see. But yes, I have a dream. All right, so the last piece, do I still have time? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, last piece I'll go through just to let you know what's there because somebody also made the uh, what about the energy comment. Um, let's talk about photonics. So photonics is another key research area for the machine. And photonics essentially means... Um, Uh, using light uh, in order to handle all communications. So I think all of you are familiar, if you open up any computer or if you plug a network cable into a computer, you're largely plugging in a copper cable and all of the traces on a motherboard are largely all copper traces. And it turns out that jamming electrons through copper is a very high energy consumption task. And so if you can eliminate the need for jamming electrons through copper, you actually get two benefits. One is you dramatically reduce energy requirements. And two, you get actually better performance. And so we are doing a lot of research um, in the area of photonics. So one of the things that people ask me is, well, haven't we been using things like fiber optic cables and fiber channel on storage or um, the telco industry using um, undersea cables for communications and things. And yes, that's all true. The challenge in what's new and the innovation that we're doing is getting to cost profiles at distance levels that are actually interesting. So the problem with saying, let's just go grab the telco photonics thing and put that in the computer is it will cost you millions of dollars. It's a very high powered laser and you sort of don't need that. And so the idea is if you can create very, very tiny, tiny lasers um, and multiplex a lot of wavelengths of light, you can actually uh, achieve interesting levels of performance. So your photonics tutorial for the day is there are uh, two major um, technology category for photonics. One's called Vixels and the other is called SIP or Silicon Photonics. For those of you who like acronyms, VIXELS uh, stands for Vertical Cavity Surface Emitting Laser. Um, and it is the primary uh, use in the telco industry, or excuse me, in the, the um, computing industry for doing things like connecting a uh, fiber channel cable or if you do have um, a fiber connection on your high-end network switch, it is likely a VIXEL connection. The simple version of how a VIXEL works is that you have a light source and you flash the laser on and off. Pretty simple. And the, now the problem with VIXELs and the detractors of VIXELs is that the flashing on and off requires a driver source, which is a piece of electronics, and that driver needs to be very close to the light. That driver and that electronic source is hot and causes reliability issues for the light. So the detractors of VIXELs essentially view um, reliability at high performance as uh, the major issue. Those who are proponents of VIXELs say, hey, we've solved those issues. We can kind of get this to work. But the nice thing about VIXELs is they are the lowest cost option. 
And all of the work that we do from a research perspective is focused on lowering the cost even more so that implementing a photonics-based machine is at a similar cost point to copper. Okay? And that's where we put all of our VIXEL research today. The other area, which is silicon photonics, um, it works a little bit differently in that you have a single light source and you use a shutter to essentially turn the light on and off. And what that allows you to do is have a remote laser and you guide the light through a waveguide. A piece of fiber would be an example of a waveguide. But you can also do it like on a motherboard and guide the light through and you can have this one laser source and put shutters at different places where you need to guide the light. Right? And so um, our opportunities for silicon photonics are much greater performance, um, but the costs are much higher because the photonics cables known as single mode fiber are also significantly more expensive. So in this debate, so some people try to have a debate that's, that's kind of like the beta VHS debate of the 1980s. You know, it's got to be one or the other. My belief is both technologies will actually survive and the use case will dictate which technology you use. And so the more performance and distance you need, the more you'll go with silicon photonics, the more cost pressure you're on, and if you don't have the distance requirements, then you'll be able to use VIXELs. So we'll all kind of see how that plays out. Um, now the research work that we're doing um, is on something called um, micro ring resonators. So imagine that's a, um, a waveguide guiding light through the source. And now what you want to do is, as you know, light has multiple colors. Every one of those colors is essentially a wavelength. And so the more you can multiplex those colors together, then the more data you can jam through the cable. And so what we do at the source is we have these uh, very tiny rings. What I'm drawing here, you've got to think at the you know, nanometer scale. But we have these rings, and we have a ring for every wavelength of light. And the size of the ring dictates which wavelength or which color of the light. And it's very close to the overall source that goes around. And we use uh, something called the evanescent properties of light, where it transfers from the ring into the primary waveguide to go through. And in the end, we can use essentially 64 of these rings. And at the other end, we essentially have the reverse process. And so at the ring, you have your data, where you're flashing your light on red, blue, green, etc. That all mixes together. And then at the other end, you essentially extract your blue, green, red as an individual source. And now you have your data at the other end. And so the technical term for that is DWDM, or dense wave division multiplexing. And um, we are working on multi terabit per second links to be able to do this. Um, and that's what allows us to build a very large memory machine because even though we will have 157 nodes, all of those nodes are interconnected through that fiber connection. And we're now dealing with speed of light, very low energy, very high bandwidth transfer, such that to the point that it is still a NUMA machine, so non-uniform memory access, the uh, maximum uh, uh, hops from point to point is three hops in the architecture. So in the architecture to get from a core to the most distant memory is essentially three hops. Uh, we're still working on that, um, but the reality is it's much, much better than anything you'll see with networking or with copper. Um, the downside of using copper is that um, at the rates, at the data rates at which we're operating today, your distance is very, very short. Like if you open up your, your server, your computer, whatever today, the CPU and the memory are like super close together. They didn't do that because they necessarily wanted to or because it was necessarily the best design. They did that because they had no choice. Because if they try to separate or add distance between the CPU and the memory, you run into signal integrity issues. And so as soon as you try to do far memory, you have to add repeaters. And those repeaters essentially add latency, um, add cost, and um, uh, very complex to essentially manage through 
um, and that's where you add cache coherency layers and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, so what photonics allows us to do is go point to point with no repeaters. And, um, and while you know, electrons move through copper at let's call it a third the speed of light, we can actually get to uh, real speed of light. So even though there is a, going to be a latency there, especially for remote memory, and we want to be smart in our software about how we manage local versus remote memory, even our remote memory will be pretty darn fast. Okay? So that's the difference between um, architectures today and architectures tomorrow. So, um, and um, the energy required to sort of pump light or photons through these fibers um, in some cases is literally several orders of magnitude less um, than jamming electrons through copper. So the combination of memristors and not, being, not having to use energy to maintain state, the fact that we use photons instead of electrons to move data around, um, allows us to create a machine that is significantly lower in its energy requirements um, than um, a conventional computer today. So again, just to remind you, this is a research project um, that we told the world at Discover in June that our target is the end of the decade. And um, that is our, our public uh, commitment. I'll actually tell you a little bit of what our internal timelines are. Um, the internal timelines we're driving is to have the first prototype machine by the end of 16. Um, prototype to product is usually an 18 month activity. So think 2018. And then we essentially added two years to give us risk management. I mean, it's pretty simple because we'll probably run into this thing doesn't work and we have to re-spin this piece of silicon and we lose three months here and a month there and so on. And so we gave us a buffer in order to manage through that. But that's kind of like our internal timelines versus what we um, publicly committed to um, on, on the machine. So that is the machine. And um, hopefully this will give you some thinking about how does an operating system work? What is the impact of software over the long term? What happens to data management and databases? And if you're a hardware geek, um, you probably want to get really good at how do you work in the photonics area, um, usually very close to the um, science of quantum computing. Um, and so if you're interested in those areas, those are all pretty exciting as well. <laughs> all right, so we've got a few couple minutes for questions. Any additional questions about the machine? Yes. You know, that question's come up a couple of times, and um, at least so far, we've, um, our thought process has been conventional languages. So we have not gone to the path of, so, you know, ARM or x86 instruction sets, and then um, after that, you get to just conventional languages. And so we haven't really thought to, we need a different programming language, um, just different APIs for access to things like memory and, and things like that. Yeah. At what point did you plan to uh, start the open source development process and uh, any additional folks about how you go about that? Yeah. So, um, as I said, we have a team that is currently working on assembling the very first bits of a working kernel. Um, we are doing that on a machine simulator because you can imagine right now we don't have hardware, so we have to do this in a simulated environment. So, the work that's going on right now is building the simulator. Um, and doing the initial rounds of code. We are working with one university um, that we think has done some pretty good work in a different operating system paradigm. Um, and then the next part is we actually have to figure out the licensing model and strategy um, that we're going to use that. So, you know, that's, if you wonder what Bdale does in his day job, that's the kind of stuff he does in his day job. Um, so best guess right now, I'll say is first half of 15. So, and my desire is first quarter of calendar 15, uh, where we would open up the process to, um, our initial thought was to the university population. That's where we thought we would start because this is still more in that research category. It's probably a little bit more difficult to get the, in, the industries or the companies. We could probably get some, you know, the AT&T Bell Labs of the world or maybe IBM Research or something like that. 
um, that, that want to join and come play. Uh, but our primary target is right now universities. And we've got, I think we've got seven in the queue right now. Okay. And Columbia Law is not one of them, imagine. Any other? Yes? Um, not memory corruption, but you do touch on a different issue. Right now we have the, uh, uh, the, one of the good things about DRAM is what you just said. If, like, if things get screwed up, you know, you basically just reboot and memory is clear, right? Um, the problem we run into is more of a, let's call it a security issue, as opposed to a corruption issue, which is if you have stored data in memory, that memory is non-volatile, and you say, I don't need that memory anymore, is there a process to zero it out in a deterministic sort of way? That's more the issue that we're dealing with is because now in our case, theoretically a reboot requires zero seconds, right? Because there's no, there's no clearing, there's no, you just kind of, code's there, right? Just run, right? You have the state of your machine is there. Um, my guess is we'll end up maintaining multiple machine states in memory and a reboot is more of a change state, right? So in other words, boot with this state, that state, or the other state is uh, what we'll go through. And the challenge we'll have to deal with is as a process allocates persistent memory and then says um, the equivalent of a free instruction to free that memory, um, that free instruction is no longer wipe a pointer. That free instruction needs to go zero out the memory. That's more what we're dealing with. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Have, have, have you thought much about uh, the implications for application architecture? And I'm thinking in particular ways in which caching is uh, important not just for volatility, but for latency. And of course, the network will still have a lot of latency, so you might need to be CDNs and caching from browsers and all that. I mean, it's right. going to be very disruptive to ship that also. Correct. So, um, those things are still at the application level. We haven't gone deep into um, do we want to define an application architecture. Um, you're right, there is a network latency that we can't eliminate. Um, and so people will want to cache local data, especially network data. Um, but we think that is an application problem to essentially deal with. And at least right now, we're looking at the data management problem, not the generic application management problem. Yep. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you, you hit an area which uh, falls into the mechanical design of the machine, which is how do we manage fault zones? Um, and so we do have a strategy for fault zone management, so data redundancy, and how do we recover in disastrous scenarios? Um, how do we do active-active kinds of configurations? Um, so there is a strategy around all of the mechanical design for that. One of the things most people are not aware of is HP invented the notion of copy on write. And so we can do a, let's call it a zero latency double write to two radically different locations in memory um, uh, without incurring a, uh, a lag on the app or a blocking uh, activity on the app. Um, and so, so we do have strategies on how to manage that process. Yeah. Okay, you're gonna have now this funny experience because lawyers' heads never explode because when they don't know what's going on, they just keep their poker face. So <laughs> you thought that everybody's head was going to explode and it was only the geeks and some of us already knew. Um, but you did shake them up. Uh, and if there wasn't free software in there, you'd have shook me up plenty. <laughs> because we'd be in deep trouble. Yeah. Um, so thanks for bailing me out here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I understand that your dream is you can retire after the SOC and the photonics, but I can't yeah. retire until free software. So thanks a bunch. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody.